So we've been, <clears throat> I am trying to make my way. The word of God, it just it seems like um, the deeper, the, the, the more you uncover, the deeper the hole in the word of God. It just, it just keeps coming. It's like the, the well gets deeper and deeper. And we've been talking about Second Peter, and we talked about uh, add to your faith. And it just seems like there are, there's just, the list doesn't, you know, it's almost like when somebody puts a bunch of, uh, just a huge pile of pasta on your plate, and it's like you eat, and you're full, and you look at the plate, and it's like, did I even start yet? It feels like this is that way. It's like the more you, the more you consume of it, the, 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 the bigger the plate gets, or the bigger the pile gets. But we've talked about adding to your faith, <clears throat> goodness, um, being integrity which is not the actions of uh, doing good, but really the reality of being good. So uh, many people get the doing good part. They find some kind of a religious organization and they do something nice and they feel better about themselves. We talked about knowledge, but not what, I, what do I know, but who do I need to know? <clears throat> the third piece was Peter's puzzle in uh, self-control, talking about Temperance, and when he talked about temperance, the, the the scriptures that he used and the 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 attachments that he made to other ideas is more in the mind. So we we can discipline ourselves to do and not do, but it's more of a discipline of being more spiritually aware of the things that are going on around us, whether it be people, whether it be the spiritual realm, whether it be needs that are around us, but a keen awareness of the devil's tactics. So we're talking about. Uh, uh, self-control, controlling ourself. How do you control ourselves? The Bible talks about the renewing of our mind. By the renewing of your mind that you may prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, I want to do the per good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, then renew your mind. Why? Because if your mind's in charge, if you can have your mind that's in charge controlled by the Holy Ghost, we can avoid almost everything else. We can avoid all of the pitfalls. So we want to make sure that we have that kind of discipline and we're aware. Then we went to perseverance. Don't give up. We talked about that. While others are complaining and panicking or protesting or just giving up, <clears throat> there, is a, there is a godly hope that is in the, the lives of someone who has perseverance, godly yeah. Perseverance. It's it's like they keep getting smacked down and they keep getting up and saying, No, no, I'm I'm living for God. But what about this? And and things are taken away and, and other things, bad things might be added into their life and they say, Doesn't matter. I made up my mind. And I mentioned this to a to, to someone just a few days ago. I said, We need to get in our hearts this this special perseverance that says, like the three Hebrew children, that says no matter what they were confronted with, all right, if you don't bow down and worship, we're going to throw you into the fiery furnace. Okay. And then they're like, oh, these, they must not have heard us. Let's tell them again. You're going to get thrown in. Um, okay. Okay. That's fine. Um, we're going to heat it up hotter like that makes any difference. <clears throat> they were just trying to specifically intimidate them. And they made a comment that uh, that I preached on a long time ago. We be not careful to answer you. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to pray about it. We don't have to have to wait. We don't have to fast. We don't have to ask counsel. We made a decision that we're never going to serve any other God other than Jehovah God. And no matter what you say, I'm not changing my mind. In other words, do what you're going to do. Just do it. So when we make up our mind, I, I, in, in the message 10 years ago, I said, the problem is, is that if we don't make up our mind before circumstances come, then when circumstances come, now we're starting to try to figure it out and we start calculating. Well, what if, what if this, what if I do, what if this, per, what, what if I, and then this, and then what, and we start doing all these calculations, which make us 99% of the time lose it. We, we just, we don't make a right decision because we're in the middle. Peter looks up at the storm. <gasps> just need to make a decision. God told me to walk and I'm going to walk. Don't look at everything that's happening around you. So perseverance. First Peter 2.12, um, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, 
they may by your good works, which they shall behold. They are watching. They will glorify God in the day of visitation. Notice this. There are people. Um, they, they might speak against you as evildoers, but they may by your good works. They may someday glorify God because we respond differently. Um, when circumstances hit our lives and we make a decision that does not make logical sense, people are watching us. They Believe me, they are watching you. And when they see you not waver, they see you make decisions that don't make sense. And they just can't figure it out. They come to you and say, didn't this just happen in your life? Yes. Well, weren't you attached to this? Yes. Why aren't you like screaming and hollering and kicking? And I have a hope inside of me that is greater than any circumstance that can affect me. I don't respond to circumstances by serving God. I serve God because I love him, because I believe in him. I have faith in him. I trust him. And no matter what happens, it will mold and shape my life <clears throat> into what he wants me to be. It's that simple. And when people see that, it, it affects them because people all around them are claiming Christianity. But they act just like they do. But when they see people in circumstances and they don't act like the traditional Christian does, something's different about you. Yes, there is. We can change people's destiny by how we respond to circumstance. But we have to get the hope of the gospel. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. That means the hope has to be there first. How do you give an answer of the hope when the hope's not there? So we need to get a relationship with God so the hope that's in us is greater than any pain, any disability, than any trial, tribulation, no matter what. We have to make that decision ahead of time. The Apostle Paul also helps us understand this concept <clears throat> of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.16. I've used this scripture as many times as it relates to the oneness of God. The Bible says without controversy. There is no controversy. There is no, there is no debate. There is no, there, there is no other truth of this in the word of God other than this. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. God was. It doesn't say Jesus was. It says God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels as if he wasn't already seen of angels in heaven. Preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So we look at that and say, <clears throat> that's a perfect depiction of what Jesus did while he was on the earth. So this must be talking about Jesus. So God must be Jesus because it says God did all the things that Jesus did. But on the other hand, it also follows Paul's instructions about the qualifications of elders and deacons in the church, and that's not a coincidence. So he talks about godliness in, in Timothy. And it's not, first of all, it's not optional for any Christian. We think that God is just talking about uh, just, just spiritual leadership. Aren't we all supposed to be spiritual leadership in the church? We're all supposed to be <clears throat> led of the Spirit. We're supposed to lead other people to Him. But for church leaders... This scripture in 316 is foundational. We cannot effectively lead without these principles. So before we look for anything else in a leader, we need to look for godliness. Doesn't matter how gifted, talented, how wise, how eloquent, how capable that person might possibly be if they're not godly then everything that they have and possess is worthless. It's worthless. We have to be godly. So Paul said that godliness is a mystery. Does that mean that we can't know it? No, because he tells us we need to be godly. So now he's making a requirement of something that we can't know about. Well, that's ridiculous. Uh, some people say that God is a mystery and that there's no way we can know him. That would be a false 
statement as well, because if we don't know him, then he will tell us, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So if we can't know him, we're all going to hell. So it can't mean that. A lot of times when you study the word of God, you can put things together that way and say, well, if this was true for everyone, no, that can't be true. So it's possible to know him, and it's possible to know the mystery of godliness. What does that really mean? What it really means is there's really no earthly explanation for it. If someone figures out and starts to become godly in God's eyes, then it must be because the power of God is working through them. It can't come by our own ability. That would be self-righteousness, humanism, etc. But we can't be godly on our own. The only way we can be godly or the only way we can even be holy, which is an exchange of the word holiness and godliness, they're basically the same, is that we get the Holy Ghost in us and it begins to mold and shape us into what he wants us to be. The only way anyone in this world can have any holiness whatsoever, God said, oh, that's self-righteous. No, he said, be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So we have to be holy. What does that mean? That mean like we're gods right now? No, we can allow God's influence so much in our life that we, become to, we begin to sound like him. We begin to look like him. We begin to act like him. And God said we can do that if we will submit to his spirit and his word. It can mold and shape us into what he is like. That's what the word Christian actually means, like Christ. If we want to be a Christian, then we need to be like Christ. If I'm not like him, then I must not be a Christian. Well, I believe in him. That's not what it says. It says to become like him. So if it really is a mystery and it can't, can't really be known by our own intellect our own talents, our own abilities, then God's power must be working in us and it must come from God. So in this scripture, he tells us six things about, about godliness that really Jesus exemplified. He implies that it's necessary for us to imitate these same six principles. Obviously, there are more in the Bible, but at least these six are very important. First of all, the Bible says Jesus appeared in a body. It says God was manifest in the flesh. Manifest means to be made known, made visible, etc. So, so he says God was manifest. God was made known in the flesh. Well, how can that pertain to us? The godly make God personal. We actually bring God close and make God's presence tangible to humanity. People begin to feel God in us. They don't just feel God in the world, but they feel God in us. Why? Because Jesus was simply a body possessing the Spirit of God. And if we can do that as well, people will start. We can manifest God to the people we can do that. There's something different about you. I can tell you what that is. It's not me. It's not my abilities. It's simply God in me. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. That's who Jesus was. God in Christ reconciling, loving, restoring, relationally bringing people unto himself. And if we want to be Christ-like, then we need to be the same thing. God in us, reconciling the world unto that God, not unto us, but unto the God that's in us. We can do that. We literally allow Jesus to appear in a body. I feel that nervousness a little bit. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm trying to be God. I'm saying I need to act like him. I, when I speak, do, don't we hear that we're supposed, to, we're supposed to hear and repeat? Aren't we supposed to obey him when he tells us to do things? Jesus said, I don't do anything that the Father, the Spirit, tells me to do. 
That's what we're supposed to do. He simply was an example. We look at his word and we say, I'm not sure I could ever accomplish that. And he said, be of good cheer. That's the English term. Be of good cheer. (laughs) King James wrote it. So be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He said, the things that I'm telling you to do, you can do them if you take the guide who's already been down the journey, down the road, and has overcome death, get him in you, and he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He'll give you the power. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. All these things will be available to us if we let him. So we can become like him. Yes. The second part, it says, Jesus was justified by the Spirit. The word justified, vindicated. Oh, my <laughs> Should I, talk? I may be talking about this one the rest of the night. Anyone ever get falsely accused? We spend most of our time trying to fulfill our deep desire to be vindicated when we feel misused, underappreciated, misunderstood, wrongfully accused. Vindication. Well, I'm going to prove you wrong. Okay. That's, that's exactly what Jesus did. Proved everybody wrong. When they accused him, he just spent all of his time talking. He did. Like a lamb before the shears is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. He just let them talk. And then he said, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We love to vindicate ourselves. I would never do that, and I'm going to make sure you understand that. Okay, you can do that if you want. But the godly know that in this fallen world in which we live, being slandered and offended is inevitable. God said it would be. When you are offended, he gives us, he gives us a recipe. Here's what you do. If you have an offense, do this. Well, I don't want to do that. Okay, then stay offended. I have a recipe. Take this pill, (laughs) the pill from heaven, the pill that says, go to that person and tell them what you're feeling and what what you believe might have happened and work it out. That's what he said. I love how Jesus also said, he said, if you're mad at somebody because they offended you, then go to them. But if you know that that person is offended at you, you go to them. So either way. If you did it, or you know that they think you did it, or somebody did it to you. He said, you notice the room gets real, real small when he starts talking like that. It's like, well, good, at least he didn't say that. I have to go. He made it so that no matter what, he said, I want my church to get along. And instead of holding a grudge, go to them and say, this is what happened. He didn't say accuse them. He said, Man, this, this happened. This is how I feel about it. Let's talk about it, and let's move on. Let's, let's get it out instead of holding a grudge because it creates bitterness. Bitterness eats up its container, and it will destroy any one of us that holds on. Wow, that's not even in my notes. But you will be slandered. You will be offended. But... We need to make sure we don't exhaust ourselves trying to manage what everybody else thinks and says. Can't manage all that. And don't tell everybody what somebody, what you think somebody did to you. It doesn't fix it. It makes it worse. So just assume this is going to happen. And when it happens, a Christian goes to them and says, it appears that I have offended you. I'm sorry I did that. If I don't know what I did, you say, is there anything? It it appears that you're separating from me. It it appears like you're avoiding me. Um, Could you please help me understand why I'm feeling this way? Maybe they say, no, there's nothing wrong. I don't know why. I just took a left when you thought I was going to take a right. I, I have no idea. I have no offense at all. Well, thank you. I just wanted to get that. I wanted to make sure. I wanted to be a Christian. Wow, the room's getting small. I'm getting boxed into a corner. But that's the right way to do it. Instead of, 
seeking counsel from 42 other people that feel the same way you do. <laughs> it doesn't fix it. In fact, if anybody is spiritual that you're telling, now you've just proven to them that you're not spiritual because it's gossip. So just know you're going to get offended. And we have to decide now, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust in his time to vindicate me. I'm telling you, it works. There was a time long time ago in another world. <laughs> and there was a situation in which I felt I needed to seek vindication. And that's right when Eli Hernandez called me. Not provoked by me. He called me up. He said, brother, I have a word for you. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was happy about it, but it didn't sound good. And he said, a season of silence. I didn't like that at all. Because how do you vindicate yourself unless you open your mouth? So... My response was simply, for how long? <laughs> how long do I need to keep my mouth shut? He had no idea, by the way. There was no, inf he just said, the Lord told me to call you and tell you season of silence. And I'm like, okay, how long? He said, until I call you back and tell you it's okay. I'm still waiting. <laughs> and we all know that that's never going to happen. Not unless, you know, he shows up in angelic form and speaks to me. But what is God saying to me? I got this. And God absolutely, within a week, within a week, took care of the whole circumstance. And it was so much better than if I would have done it. I mean, there, there'd still be earthquakes going on and thunder and lightning if I... So God just said, I got this. And I learned an awesome lesson that day. It was, it was actually a multiple lesson. It was a lesson in submission. But, but I couldn't tell him anything because I wasn't supposed to. So I couldn't vindicate myself. I couldn't share with him just how mad I was. He knew nothing about what happened, who was involved, nothing. So I simply had to go, yes, sir. Got it. So I learned submission to a deeper degree. But I also learned that God is a greater advocate than anybody else could be. Anybody else. Anybody else. And if I start to trust God, and if you start to trust God, put it in God's hand. He's got a way bigger paddle than I do. I mean, God can straighten us out. When nobody else can get to you and me, God can get to us. <clears throat> and he does a way better job at fixing the problem than we ever could. Wow. So God, in his timing will take care of vindication. Jesus was seen of angels. The godly people live with, with an awareness that the real battle and their real audience lies beyond the physical realm in which we live. The world that we live in is not the real world. You are a spirit, but you live in a body. The body is the physical realm. The spirit is obviously by label the spirit realm. We simply are passing through. We are a spirit, but we live in this body. This is not immortal. Our spirit goes back to God, who is immortal. Our soul is immortal, but our flesh is not. So we are a spirit, but we, this is not the real world. This building is not the real world. The real eternal world is the world that we can't see. 
the world that we can feel glimpses. We can see glimpses of of the supernatural. We can see angels sometimes. We can feel them. We can see the effects. Even, even the Word of God says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. We can see. It's like the wind. We can hear the sound and we can see its effects, but we can't see the actual wind. The Spirit is the same way. We can see the effects of the Spirit. And I made a comment to somebody, it was Monday or, or Sunday, and I said, <clears throat> you know how you, how you say sometimes, you know, hey, man, the Holy Ghost is all over you. But if it's invisible, you can't see it. What are you saying? I'm saying I can see the effects of the Holy Ghost on you. I can see what it's doing to you. It's making you weep. It's making you tremble. It's making you <clears throat> open up your heart. It's making you speak in tongues. It's making you trust him more. It's increasing your confidence in him. But there is, a, there is a realm that we can't physically see. And if we end up seeing an angel, God has simply manifested him or the Spirit of the Lord or whatever. Like the Bible says many times the Spirit of the Lord was seen. <clears throat> Gideon, you know, the Spirit of the Lord was there. You have wrestling with the Lord. Jacob wrestling with the well what was that he could see it obviously he was grabbing hold of his ankles and trying to stop him from going and there was a there was a major interaction God just simply allowed that temporarily but it was the spirit realm it was a spiritual change that Jacob was looking for not a physical change so he was seen by angels it the world that we that we really operate in is supposed to be the spirit didn't he say walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh if we walk in the flesh then we will fulfill the lusts of this flesh which are mainly sinful and God said I have a place that you can walk and live that is greater than the realm where sin lives if you learn to walk in the spirit you can learn to overcome these things in the flesh if you'll walk in the spirit so, they know that they engaged in something much greater than themselves, the godly. They know that this world in which we operate, and we, we will grow tremendously faster <clears throat> if we realize that this is an eternal realm that we're living in, and this physical realm is only temporary. It's by most 70 80 years that God said, and in some even a little bit more than that. But typically, that's the average. That's not even one grain of sand in all of the oceans of the world, one grain of sand for 80 years. That's nothing. What we need to learn to do is we need to learn to operate in the Spirit since that's where we're going to be for eternity. God never intended that to be some kind of surprise. What's this? I'm not sure I want to live here in the Spirit. We need to learn how to operate in the Spirit so we don't fulfill those lusts of the flesh. So when we operate in the Spirit, though, it, there can be some scary things that we, because demons are there as well. That's why the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, living for Him without sin gives us confidence to challenge the spirits that we may encounter in the Spirit. But if we don't walk in the Spirit, someone said to me a long time ago, I'm not sure I want to be used, for, used by God. Why? Because anybody that's tremendously used of God usually ends up falling into sin somehow. And I said, well, that, that's, that's true in a lot of instances, but there's only one thing that scares me even more, disobeying the will of God. That scares me far more than what I could encounter in the Spirit. Yes. Their lives may make little or no sense to their neighbors, but there's a heavenly audience watching their every move with focused attention. We need to realize that there are angelic beings looking. looking. Boy, that looks like fun. Now, I don't know that I, I don't have a lot of scripture on what's going on. I mean, does Brother Yant see us right now? I don't know. Probably not. 
I don't see that because he would see some of the bad stuff going on. The Bible says there's no sorrow in heaven. He would see people dying lost. That's not, there's nothing joyous about that. He would see people addicted and fighting and abuse, and he would see all of that. And I don't know if maybe God can put, like when you look at the sun, you got those little glasses, you can look at a solar eclipse. Can God put that kind of, he could do anything, right? So I don't know. It doesn't talk about it a lot. But I would assume that we probably can't see once we're there what's going on here. Um, praise God. But our lives many times make little or no sense to people that are operating in the flesh. If we're living in the Spirit, oh my, I think I need to go there. I will obey. If we're operating in the Spirit, there are some people that will not feel comfortable around you. You won't get invited to their house. They'll have little parties and won't invite you because you make them nervous. They get quiet. They'll be talking. The minute you walk up, whoosh, don't want to talk like that. But people are uncomfortable. If they're in the flesh, they're uncomfortable with people that operate in the spirit. So before you do that, even though we have to, don't forget that. I want to walk with God. Okay. There's some decisions that you'll have to make then because there are people that won't let you do it if you stay close to them. They won't let you. They'll constantly dump garbage in your spirit. You'll feel like you're losing, uh, losing the fight. You feel like a garbage can all the time. But we have to make sure, God, now, am I perfect? No, 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 no. But I'm telling you, there are decisions that we constantly make. Am I going to walk in the spirit? Yes. How do you know? It's when you, when you really pray through, you really get close to God, and all of a sudden you spend a small amount of time with somebody and you feel horrible. You're like, you go skipping out of the church, and you're like, woohoo, victory, victory is mine, victory is mine. You spend 10 minutes with somebody, and you're like, what happened? It's like they walk up with a, corrupted vacuum cleaner and they when they suck all that virtue out of you and you're like uh, am I even saved you all been there you, all, you know what I'm talking about but what I'm talking about is our lives make no sense to many people in this world they look at us and they're like why do you why do you give so much to that church For starters, because I believe in it. Nobody does that. Really. Look at the people in the church that are faithful. They all believe that the word of God is true. And if we honor his word, he honors us. So we know that there are, you know, think of this when, when the prophet looks at the enemy and, and he's like, um, let's, let's get him. We're in trouble. We're in trouble, Gehazi probably said. And it was, God, let him see what, what I see. There is a heavenly host that is around us. And if we operated our lives as far as what we say and do and how we act, as if there are chariots of fire that line the mountains around us spiritually. If we really knew that and had a confidence in that, there would be things that we would get into that we would say, Lord, I'm going to get into this, and the only way I'm getting out is if you're with me. But we don't take chances. We don't, we don't operate on our faith or in faith because we're just not sure if God is going to bail us out. But when we get confident in that, when God speaks to us and says, do this, ooh, this could be bad. You're going to bail me out? Why don't you wait and see? Do you trust me? Yes. Did I tell you to? Yes. Then what does the end matter? If he said so, and we do it. See, seen by angels, do we operate in the spirit realm? Godly people cause angels to cheer and demons to tremble. 
godly people do? Do demons tremble when they get around us? Or they, or they simply say, round two of my meal. I just ate this last one. I'm gonna, I need some more. I need a second round. Jesus was preached among the nations. It says preached unto the Gentiles. The godly have, go, have a global influence. Wherever we go, people are, they get influenced by the word of God in us and our confidence in it. People that know their relationship with God actually exude, exert a powerful influence around them. And they begin to affect people's lives by influence. People around can literally be transformed inch by inch. Somebody, um, I, I guess I can share this. Um, and my brother, uh, he might even be listening tonight, but um, my brother was cutting, he, he cuts down trees, trims trees, um, even with one leg. He climbs the trees and he's hanging out of the trees. And I'm thinking, man, I don't know. Good for you. I got some trees I want you to work on. <laughs> but he was cutting a guy's trees in, uh, uh, in the Oshkosh area, Wisconsin. And, and the guy walked out, introduced himself. Uh, and he happens to be a, a, a professor at the, the UW Oshkosh and a PhD. And he, he got to talking to my brother and found out that this man, um, he is... Uh, his family is the most educated family in, in all of North America. There are more PhDs and double PhDs in his family than, than any other family in North America. So my brother's like, oh, smart dude. So yes, he is one of the 13 people speaking at the World Conference on Peace coming up in the next month. He's one of the 13 speakers in that. He has had royalty at his house. Um, he knows uh, President Obama. He knows President Clinton has had them in parties. There are royalty that came to his daughter's wedding. I mean, this guy is well known. Uh, uh, in uh, He came from Africa. I think it was Nigeria. I believe it was. And I, I said all of that. He's preached among the nations. We have powerful influence. This man is writing a book right now on world peace. And my brother was there. And he said, well, I have your answer already. He's like, what? The Holy Ghost. Double PhD. It's like the Holy Ghost. I'm writing a book on, and you want me to write about the Holy Ghost. What's that? Well, my brother started talking to him, and, and in that conversation, this man, doctor, his, uh, his wife comes walking out of the kitchen, and she said, did I hear somebody say Holy Ghost? My brother said, yeah. He said, I was in a Bible study uh, two weeks ago, and as they were teaching, this, this presence of God, this presence came upon me, and I began to tremble. My lips were, were, and I had so much difficulty speaking a language that I could understand. Is that the Holy Ghost? My brother said, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. Here you have somebody, there's no way we could ever. So my brother is talking to me about what's ha what happened, and he said, Hold on a minute, bro. I said, what? He said, Mr. Uh, Fulcrum is right here now, and um, I, I'm going to put you on speaker. I'm like, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Who's this? Bob. Hi. He said, this is my brother who I've been telling you about. Oh. And he said, he said so we, we kind of talked a little bit back and forth, and he said, my brother gave me your testimony. I said, sorry about that. And he laughed, and he started talking. I said, well, I have your answer. And he said, what? I said, Jesus never went after the kings and the queens to try to change the world. He went after one at a time. I said, he never went after them top down. He went from the bottom up, one soul at a time. And, and he, he kind of said, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. I said, change a person, change their family, change their family, change the neighborhood, change the neighborhood, Change the community, change the community, change the city, change the city, change the state. He said, well, I'm sure that takes a long time. I said, not ah, physically, yes. But spiritually, the Bible says that the disciples turned the world upside down. 
the ones that knew Jesus. He said, it says that? I said, absolutely. And when I, he said, I like what you're talking about. He said, I want you to, to edit your brother's chapter. He has my brother writing a chapter for his book on world peace, which will be over a million copies like in no time. He's got other books he wrote. But he said, I want you to edit that copy. So I did. And I sent it to him. Who knows? One person at a time. One inch at a time. Can we have spiritual info? I don't know this guy. I would never meet him. <clears throat> but our influence can go beyond the confines of time and place where we are. We can affect people. I don't know. He wants to come to a apostolic Pentecostal service. I said, 270 East Schick Road. I'm not afraid. I don't care who he is. I mean, he could, he could tell Obama about me and I get thrown in jail somehow. I don't know. I don't care. I did what God told me to do, and therefore I trust him with the outcome. Nothing may come of it, but I don't know. We'll see. The godly. He was believed, Jesus was believed on in the world. The godly have impact beyond the church walls. In fact, they literally transform the world. We can do that. We have the power to do that. Then Jesus was taken up in glory. The godly know that their life and purpose have a reward in the end. We live here and now, but we keep our eyes fixed on forever. Our eyes are not fixed on today or tomorrow or what's happening next week. Our eyes say and our heart says, I'm going to heaven. Someday that trumpet is going to sound and I am going to do everything that I know to do. And if I'm missing something, somebody please tell me. Because I want to know, what does it take to punch my ticket to go when that trumpet sounds? That's what I'm interested in. And I love the fact that Jesus gave that story when he went to the marketplace and grabbed a bunch of people to work. And, and then came back you know, a couple hours later. And, and then came back a couple hours later. And then came back one hour before before the day was done and, and told them, I'll pay you whatever's fair. And he paid them all the same. So if there are people that are coming into the church now, the pay is the same. Heaven. We get to go to heaven. Well, what if I come in in the end? The pay is heaven. What if I came in 25 years ago and then I left God and I came back just two days ago? The payment is heaven. He said, the payment's the same. He said, leave it up to me. He said, did I not promise you I'd pay you X amount? Yes, you did. Well, then I'm not lying to you, and I'm not, I, didn't, I didn't cheat you. I told you I'd pay you this much, and that's what I'll pay you. What he's saying is, God is no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter what happened in the last day, in the last year, in the last 20 years. Makes no difference. God says, come and serve me now, and I'll give you heaven forever. What an awesome God. What a generous God. So we already have faith. Over the last five lessons, now including tonight, we examine Peter's simple yet irritating claim. We struggle with this. We have trouble with that. We do this. And Peter says, you already have what you need. <laughs> then where is it? Must, I must have a hole in my pocket because it fell out somewhere. There are people, you know, um, there are people that struggle with that reward and they struggle with the things of this world. If we keep our eye on him and we live in light of eternity because our treasure is in heaven, not on this earth, things will be much easier when we make decisions now and when we know that doing right will cause us to be with him for eternity. I, I don't care about streets of gold. They don't impress me at all. Today it would be good, but not once I get there. Who cares? Gates, the side, the one, one pearl, the side, I mean, who cares? I'm just looking for him. I just want to find him when I get there. Would you mind standing with me? <clears throat> we talk about adding to our faith. Tonight we add, our, add unto our faith and godliness, things that are important to him 
for us. Now remember, these are not things that we need when we get there. We won't need anything when we get there. The things that God tries to give us are for us here. We don't twiddle our thumbs and hope we make it. We say, if that's what you want me to do, then that's what I do now in preparation for then. Many of these, if not all, I didn't, I didn't compare the two, but are the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering is patience. We already went through that. Goodness. So we, 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 a lot of them are the fruit of the Spirit. And God said, you need these. We don't need the fruit of the Spirit in heaven. We leave all this junk behind. But we need it now. Why? Because it produces a supernatural fruit in us that people look at us and say, there's only one way you could have that kind of fruit. You found something that I don't know where it is. And I want to be like that. But godliness, are you ready when the trumpet sounds? Is there the Spirit of God dwelling comfortably in us? One person said it this way. Because the Scripture says, if the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, then that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his Spirit that is in you. He said, I, I get the analogy of a, of a tuning fork. Like a tuning fork. It's like the shout, the, the trumpet of God sounds, and that frequency, if we're in tune with him, all of a sudden, we begin to, we begin to respond. And he goes, same frequency, same frequency, same frequency. When he brings that shout, when it, if it rings in us, it goes, whew, gone, just like that. Something needs to resonate inside. If the spirit dwell in you, then it will make alive your mortal spirit or your mortal body by his spirit, which is in you. So there's something in us, the spirit of God, that actually makes us alive when the trumpet sounds. That means he has to be there. He has to be active in our life, in our heart, right now when the spirit, when the trumpet sounds. God, I want to be ready. Yes. Would you mind just coming up and saying, Lord, I just want to be like you. I want to be a Christian. I want your spirit in me to affect those that are around me. I want the power to be available in me to overcome this world. Lead me and guide me into all truth. Help me to overcome this world Touch my mind. Let the gifts of the Spirit, God, work in me. Let me be ready, Jesus. Let your Spirit be active and alive in me. I want to go to heaven. I want to spend eternity there, but I don't want to do it alone, God. I want to be like you so that I could affect my family. I could affect the world that I live in, God, my community. I pray for that, God. I want to be like you. I want people to feel Jesus when they're around me. I want to obey your word. I'm going to be offended. And when I am, help me do the right thing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you my Lord and my Redeemer. Let everything that I say and do and think, let it be motivated by you and let it be acceptable. God, let the abundance of my heart be Christian. Let my heart be so filled with you that it spills out no matter where I go, no matter who I talk to. God, let it let me be so full of you that nothing else matters. I don't spend my life trying to vindicate. I don't spend my life, God, trying to please humanity. 
but I spend my life trying to please you. Do you want to please him today? Let the word of God, the spirit of God, let it mold us and shape us. Let it make us more like him today than, it, than we were yesterday. Yes, God. I want to be like you because I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are, Jesus, for eternity. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait. I want to see you, Jesus. I want to tell you how grateful I am for the price you paid for my freedom. I want to tell you how grateful I am for you empowering me with your spirit so I could live for you in this present world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the word that we still have. Thank you for the spirit of God. Lord, that leads us the word that is a lamp. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the church, the brothers and sisters, God, that encourage us. God, that pray for us, that reach for those that have stumbled and fell, those that are no longer in the church, those that have, God, been deceived. I pray for them, God. That's what you would do. You went to that woman at the well, Lord, all alone, rejected, afraid, betrayed. And yet you went to her and gave her truth. One soul was important to you, but she went back and you practically won a whole city because of it, God. Could those have been the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost? It's possible. God. There were 120 in the upper room, God, but it wasn't long until you were reaching. Philip went down to Samaria. God, I pray that you would help us to affect. Let the Spirit of God in us change our world. Let us be an example. Let us be an example of you to this world, Lord. Not living for you one day and the minute we walk out the front door, God, we're not living for you. Let my words be the same inside the church as they are outside. Let my actions and passions be the same in here than they are outside. Let me live as if the trumpet is near. Let me make a difference in my world, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Can we offer our vessel to him tonight? I'm yours, Jesus. I'm yours. I do have a choice, but I really don't, God. I'm supposed to love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, strength, all of it. Help me do that, Jesus. Help me to love you with all of me. Teach me. Take these people, God, some people on Monday night began to experience the impartation, the power of God because they became vulnerable to you the heart was opened and things began to be deposited in their spirit. Those are the things that change us. Jesus, do it again tonight. All of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you want it tonight? Yes, God. Help me draw close to you, Jesus. Help me trust you with more. That seems to be the theme lately. More of you. God, I want to do more. 
How can I do more without possessing more? I need to have more power, more confidence, more sensitivity to the Spirit, more understanding of the Word of God, more submission to you. You won't give me the power that I need unless I'm submitted to you. You won't do it. It's too dangerous. So help me condition myself so that you can trust me with more, God. This world is crying out for more. They're looking for a church that possesses the power of Almighty God. They know it exists because it's in the Bible. Come on, let them find it in us. Are we not the church? Should they not find the supernatural in us? We need to be the church that he works through. The ecclesia, the ecclesia, the called out ones. God, there needs to be a dominion that gets a hold of us, a confidence that causes the enemy to shudder when we walk into their city. We need that, God, and this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. We don't deserve it. It just sensitizes us. God, it causes you to trust us with greater power and greater authority. Let us possess it, Lord. Whatever it takes, that's it. Somebody's getting it. Whatever it takes, Lord. I know I'm called. I know I'm called. But I want it to happen in me, God. So if it hasn't, then please, please do whatever it takes to condition me so you can trust me with more of you. I want more. I want more. It is not your desire for us just to be saved. It's your desire for us to be used. Jesus. Jesus. Help me make decisions that draw me closer to you, Lord, and not farther away. Stagnancy is not something you're interested in. Let me grow. God, let your spirit, your word, and leadership condition me to be trustworthy. Do you trust me, Lord? Do you trust me? I want to be trustworthy. I want you to be able to trust me, Lord. With what? With power over men and women's souls. If he gives some people power, they'll use it to draw people to them, but their intention is nothing to do with their soul. I want to be able to use your power to draw people to you, Jesus, not me. It doesn't matter to me who you provide that power to, God. Just let them magnify your name. Let them give glory into your kingdom, your throne. But God, we need to be trustworthy. Oh, I feel something in this room right now. We can have it. We have to have the right intention. God knows the thoughts of the intents of the heart. I don't want to be a failure, God. Is that why you're doing what you're doing? No. No, God, I want to do the will of God. That's what I want more than anything. Being a failure means we care what other people think. I don't care, God. I just don't care. I care what you think. I want you to be able to trust me, Lord. God, let me find a place of prayer that causes this flesh to die. You can trust a dead man, Lord. (laughs) <laughs> That's somebody. You, they'll never do anything wrong again when they're dead. They'll never say anything wrong when they're dead. Hallelujah. God. That's why Paul said, I die daily. Because I know I need it. Lord. I want to hear. And I want to verbalize what I'm hearing, God. I need you. I don't want to be blown around with every wind of doctrine. 
but I want to be stable in you. I want to know that my beliefs, the doctrines that we follow, God, they're founded in you and your word. God, we're hungry. There's somebody hungry right now. Somebody that's never experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can feel him right now. And if you'll just open up your heart to him, apologize for any past failures. Lord, I'm sorry. I've repented a thousand times, God, but if that's what it takes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm not what you want me to be. I'm sorry, Lord, that I have disobeyed you. If I have done something, Lord, that I don't know about, I didn't know it was wrong. I pray that you forgive me for that. But God, I want to be right with you. I want to be available for you to draw close to me. Come on, if you do that, he'll come. And then once you get done, you just begin to worship him. It will never change, so get used to it. Repentance with worship and obedience. I just gave you a recipe for a constant drawing closer to him. Repent, worship, and submit to the presence of God that comes. Obedience. Because if we don't obey, it's rebellion. He won't come any closer. I submit and I obey God. But I worship you. Hallelujah. Open up your mouth and begin to worship him right now. Glory and honor and power and blessing unto you. Awesome, mighty, compassionate, kind, all-knowing, patient God. Yes, Jesus. Thank you for introducing yourself to me. I want more of you. Fill my mind, fill my heart with your presence. Fill it to overflowing right now, Lord. Let it erupt like a well out of my soul right now, God. If you'll submit to him, those precious Holy Ghost words will come flowing out of your innermost being. You begin speaking to him in a language you don't understand. You can have it right now. Hallelujah. It's given by faith. He gave it, and it's received by faith. Yes. 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 Jesus. Come on, what do you need? Come on right now, believe him. I need you. I need you, Jesus. Come on. Come on, you can trust him. He's never done anything to strip you of trusting him. It's us. Come on, that's it. We're the ones. We're the ones that separated from him. Lord, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. Oh, come on. Jesus. Jesus. 